Hello, cousins. Welcome to SAS Mass, our spirituality and support symposium. Think morning witchy chats around a warm campfire. The recording has started, and by participating in SAS, you agree to read and accept the terms of engagement, which I'll post in the chat. We ask that you mute during the recording for clarity during the meeting and for the afterplay. We'll now get started with a few announcements. And I'm, yeah, go ahead, Maria. Let me do the announcements. Okay. Did you have any announcements, Ocean? Not, not yet. <laughs> not yet. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Maria. Um, so we have rituals and revelry that just finished up uh, today. So congratulations to all those witches that participated in our staycation style retreats. We have Jem Marie over there with wit, I saw. And uh, Acacia's over there as well. And we had uh, Kim facilitating from uh, a virtual space. So that was awesome. Um, this was our second staycation style retreat. Um, and that's pretty awesome. We are now pro like as far as the event, which is which wit is our uh, like event coordinator. We're going to probably be switching full gear into planning for the autumnal convergence um which is our own right now it's our only in-person event for members of the foundations and the guild and that happens every year in like late september early october those are uh, basically around the autumnal um space and so you can read about that in the members area, um, like in the welcome, if you just scroll down a bit, it has a lot of information. Um, there's a ticket price that includes food, your all your meals for the weekend. And there's a separate price for lodging. Um, we are returning to the same space that we had last year, which in a way is nice because um, it kind of helps with the preparations. It's on a beautiful lake. Um, it's a really awesome space. Um, so yeah, just let us know if you have questions about that. We're happy to answer any of your questions. You can send a message, um, through the chat. Like if you go to the website, you'll see the little chat and that gets a message right to us. You can also email support at brightanddark.org. You can post a message on the Facebook page. Sometimes it's a little bit hard of, um, keeping track of like the messages cause they don't always post in chronological order. So just know that um, contacting us through the website is the best and fastest way to get an answer to any of your questions. Um, and again, too, because we're all neurodivergent. So it just helps like filter in those uh, questions to one place. Um, so we appreciate that. Um, the biggest like and the most exciting news that we have going on as a community is this app uh, that we've been talking about for a long time. So um, the, the, we haven't had the beta testers been able to come in yet. And that's all the members of the guild, but that's going to have definitely probably going to happen this week. Um, so that we're still like, uh, sorting some things out on the app, like our descriptions of everything. Um, what's been really awesome about the app is I've been getting like reminders for meetings. So like 60 minutes before the meeting and 30 minutes before the meeting, the app, like sends me a little notification. If you want those notifications, that's been super helpful. Um, yeah, so we have we have like three different spaces, like kind of like a, our public space, a place for foundations members only, place for the guild. So we're just kind of like sorting out some of the technical bits and making sure um, it's ready. It's going to happen in stages. You're going to first be welcomed in into like this main area that we're calling the courtyard. Um, and then you'll then all the foundations members will then get access to like the members only spaces. Um, but the fastest way we could do that was to just get everybody in into like this common area that we share. And that might mean like there's members from the Facebook group that are no longer members or people that have subscribed to our newsletter. So it is kind of like a common space. Um, probably need like one more quick conversation with the support witches. And then I think we can open it up to the guild for the beta testing. So that's super exciting. That's like the, all the news. Um, it is the 16th of the month. 
which means that we are preparing for Witch Work Circle on the 21st. This is where we gather to do our spell craft, um, an ex external representation of the internal process that we've been working on throughout the month. So you'll want to make sure that you have all your supplies for that. Um, if you get to the new broom box, then you have gotten your supplies um, already. Um, if you've just signed up for the new broom box and you haven't gotten it yet, just send a message because um, the cycles that we want, we make sure you get your new broom box like at the beginning of the month. So um, we have these fixed cycles. So just reach out if you have questions about any of that, or if you want to sign up and you have questions, same place, just reach us via the website. Um, you don't have to get the new broom box. You can absolutely gather all your supplies that you need. Um, we had a great foundations dedication meeting last night. So we had a few witches make their foundations dedication candle, which uh, that meeting happens on the 15th of every month. And you use your foundations dedication candle at every sacred space and witch work circle meeting. So yes, so we're into kind of, if you're looking at your workbook, you were moved into kind of part two of that workbook where we're focused on those prompts and specifically the preparation of the spellcraft. And yeah, that's where we are. Thank you. Uh, Jen, I, don't, I know Karen has a uh, kickoff to our conversation, but I just wanted to pass it over to Jen Marie real quick to see if there's any other announcements or anything before we pass it over to Karen. Um, we, uh, and by we, I mean Akasha and Wit and I, are still kind of coming down from the weekend. And so we are we are committing ourselves to kind of rest for the rest of the day. But we're also still like really distracting. So we're going to stay off camera for the most part uh, during SAS. But we are here because we wanted to still like spend time with you guys. But I don't have any announcements. I'm uh, so here you go, Karen. I'm passing it back to you. <laughs> So this is a vent, but like mostly lighthearted ones. Be really clear about that to begin with. So this month's prompt was very impactful to me. I couldn't even read the very first prompt. <laughs> it was so big. I took time off from work to rest so that I could be prepared for the work. And I took a whole day and I like really dug in and I've made like a huge mindset shift, which is why I even felt comfortable saying I wanted to start off today. Like this is all because of that work. I feel so proud of myself and so great. And then I woke up this morning and realized there's a whole nother one needed right below that. <laughs> the whole onion thing. It's frustrating. Like, I just kind of want to, you know, revel in feeling really good. And it's like, okay, here's another one. <laughs> so that was my event. Welcome for anyone to weigh in. This was really more lighthearted, like I said. <laughs> so I, I have a question, if that's okay. Oh, so, sure. um, so tell me, talk to me a little bit about, so your feelings are like feeling really good about the work you did and then like seeing that maybe there was like another prompt or like work that you didn't get to and you feel like that how do you feel like that negates like what you did or no I just um so I've been on the journey for about 10 years mm -hmm. and I've made so many of these mindset changes but this was a really really big one and um, and I kind of felt like I could rest, if that makes sense, you know, <laughs> like I could just like enjoy this time. Um, the issue is that uh, my way of handling my trauma was to eat. And um, and I handled that as a uh, I mean, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I just. I handled it. I ate a lot of sugar. I've been addicted to sugar my whole life. And so the last few years, um, probably even five years, I've been really working on my sugar. I have very little now. It's all in moderation. 
it's manageable as I've gotten older, I've gotten terrible reflux managing that. Um, like I've been really good, but this mindset shift was so big that um, without realizing it, I fell back on some old patterns. So yesterday, while well, I was just relaxing because I, I was doing some computer work and just hanging out on the couch and doing some reading, relaxing. I was like, oh, I'm hungry. And I was eating and it was all fine. And I made a big batch of spaghetti and ate that. And I felt really good. And um, <laughs> last night I had terrible reflux, woke me up in the middle of the night. I'm crying because my throat hurts so badly. I wake up this morning with the, with the start of a migraine and I'm like, what is this? And then I realized, oh, I ate tomato products too late in the day. I, every time I went to the pantry, I ate sugar and I was like, well, duh, you know, like, of course my body and my old patterns are going to go fall back to food because my nervous system is not settled yet. I was like, okay, now I get to work on my food again. <laughs> it's just that. <laughs> Hopefully that helps. I saw somebody said a way in and it was pretty fast. And I'm okay now. I've taken my medicine for the migraine. My throat's better, but I don't know if you can tell my voice is scratching. It should last about three days now. I, I didn't see who the way in was. Sorry. Oh, Ezra. <laughs> Thank you, Shantel. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to say, like, uh, first of all, congratulations. Like, I what I'm hearing is like kind of a celebratory feeling yeah. that came first. <laughs> like that that it's a huge like this was a very like this. I feel like this uh, journal prompt was was a very big one. You know, like life changing. Lots of. <laughs> Lots of places for resistance there. And so for you to feel like you've come through that through in uh into a mind shift change, that's like a big deal. Okay. And I wanted to what it was bringing up for me was this concept of like when you kind of like uh level up, like like some people don't really like to use that terminology, but um I think it gets the point across. A lot of times you will what seems like regress uh just old briefly. pattern like yes things they and exactly and what that was kind of like described for me was like you are grounding what you learned in that uh previous level and so since we're going up the spiral you know like those things are going to come back around and like this time, you know, first of all, you're able to come and share this with people. You were able to identify it like immediately. You know, these are all like really huge things. So it's kind of like, a, you know, still a celebratory thing, even if you have some like feelings of like uh, of maybe shame for having that that moment. Um, but like now, you know, you have all these tools and it's kind of like, hey, look at what look how far you've come from the last time this happened and yes. it's just it's like so such a beautiful thing and um you I also wanted to say like you are allowed to rest whenever you want to like the the workbook are like they're they're guidelines like uh and Jen Marie has said before that like pe uh, like people in the group wanted a workbook like otherwise like and so if you're thinking of it as like rules or like it's pacing you you do absolutely you absolutely don't have to do that so if you wanted to sit with that profound like celebration that you're having inside of yourself I think that's that's what it calls for so like yeah, throw yourself a little party you know <laughs> how whatever that looks like for you no sugar <laughs> <laughs> no sugar at the party totally <laughs> Uh, yeah whatever that looks like for you now but like uh I mean even here just like congratulations that's amazing so I'm so happy for you very much that was it it didn't seem like there's any other chat if anybody else had any other comments otherwise I'm I'm fine to pass on thank you for sharing that was really awesome
Rebecca, Becca, you can, yeah. Hi. Um, I wasn't going to say anything, but then so much of what Ezra said, I was like, yes, that. <laughs> um, so I'm in, in my professional life, I'm an eating disorder dietitian. I work with people in their relationship with food. And when Ezra was talking about the spiral, I keep this like spiral in my office to show my clients like sometimes you come back like around to a problem but you're like this much higher on it when you come back around and like so you're like oh like I messed up again I'm in the same place I was and it's like no you're not in the same place you're around the spiral and up one level like um so like you're encountering the same shit but like with more skill more um experience like you like so I don't know I know sometimes people get down on themselves of like I'm in the same spot like no like you're not you just and you can work through it so much quicker and easier and, or at least a little bit quicker and easier but anyways I don't know I could talk to anybody yes with more compassion too yes Ed. absolutely absolutely thank you so much Rebecca yeah you could definitely call my sugar addiction and eating disorder um I don't have shame though. I, I realize what happened. It's all about my nervous system. I, um, and it just means I need to, it, right. Absolutely. Totally right. This is the only reason I know this. And the only reason I don't have shame is because I've done so much work and I have more tools in my tool set. Um, it's the, it's the onion that gets me sometimes. Right. And I, you know, I understand it took 45 years for all of these layers to protect myself from what was happening around me. And I now have to peel them all back and I'm, I'm doing it. <laughs> I just, yeah. yeah, it's just a lot sometimes. Yeah. Definitely ogres are not the only thing like onions. Trauma is too. You always find like another layer. Like, hey, I'm gonna work through this. Yeah, I don't know. From from my professional perspective, I was like, oh, like you got this. You know, you're like, oh, I ate tomato products too late in the day. Like, yeah, no, like you're good. Like, you you know what you need to do. Anyways, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Everything has layers. Everything's just everything's just like I, I my brain was just like everything's just a giant onion. Um which is why we cry off <laughs> when we peel them. Um, but, okay, so I had, uh, I didn't raise my hand, but I don't think anybody else is raising their hand, so I was just going to jump in. Um, yes, parfaits. Everybody loves parfaits. Um, the, I'm, I love Shrek, actually. <laughs> That's just, I love Shrek. Like, I love fairy tales and then deconstructing fairy tales and so shrek is like a huge uh thing for me like actually shrek the musical if you haven't seen it is better than the movie shrek it's really good um anyway so the let's see something that came up for me this weekend was like a so something so i've been uh doing i've been studying a lot on like parts work and um basic so kind of like internal family systems and how that works within myself and in the greater world because if i can separate my system into the into different um kind of characters then i can have them talk using nonviolent communication and i can get to the needs of each of the things that i'm doing um so there's like in this uh there's firefighters that includes like reactionary things, um, obsessions, addictions, things like that. Um, they're trying to distract from bad feelings or exiles. Um, and then there's managers who are trying to control and critique and caregive in, uh, to distract or to uh, control the exile out of existence, essentially. And um, it's only through like integrating the exiles or kind of the shadows you know that you can um come to your true self and so like I've been having them like been writing out like as as if in a play conversations um between them to uh get to the root of like what my brain was trying to do there to protect me um rather than 
my manager just critiquing all of the things that I did, including <laughs> including the judgment and critiques. Um, and so what that's helped me with, I've noticed like a, a balance shift inside of myself that I've been uh, able to uh, bring up in conversation more with other people uh, now things that I'm noticing that uh, before was like my firefighter was just trying to distract me from and to figure out like none of these things, like all these parts are part of you and it's not about getting rid of any of them. Um, and it's about each of them have something that they come to the table with. Like, you know, if you want to watch a movie, like I love movies, I love media. Like I, analyze like liter uh, literature and stuff like that all the time for fun um and it's just that when I was like a kid I would it went into like a, I was never here I was only in the in the distraction type of thing um and so now one of the things that happened was I'm mostly just celebrating because I think it went so well so but like uh if anybody has a way in when I'm done that's totally fine um but my mom has a chronic cough and she has my entire life. And it is just like this oppressive force in the house, like that we're not like really supposed to talk about because it's really sad, basically. And she's gone, gone to a bunch of doctors and doesn't know anything. They can't do anything about it. And so I have a lot of feelings about like anger at like pollution and like all that, all the shit that causes like severe asthma and coughs and whatever it is, because it also has to do with her nervous system because she'll stub her toe and then start, uh, stop coughing or start coughing like that kind of thing. Um, she'll get really nervous and start talking or and start coughing like that. And so it kind of became this thing where she was very embarrassed about it. And the like, anytime, like we could, we kind of like started slowly acknowledging it. We would, we would say like, bless you or whatever, like you do when someone sneezes and but then we just, she kind of just wanted us to move on because she didn't want to be thinking about coughing while she wasn't coughing. And it's made, and like, so last night, or was it last night? Or the night before? I don't know. But uh, I think it was the last night, uh, the night before last, like she coughed and I like kind of just like sat with it. And like, I've been trying to like breathe when she coughs um because i noticed that i get very tense and so does everybody else in the room and so i figure like if that's like a feedback loop uh you know then maybe my breathing can eventually be a feedback loop to get her air um but at the very least it will help me and so as i was so i ended up asking her about it like um because she was reading a bunch of like different kind of like alternative medicine things that, she, that her friend had been recommending her, but she doesn't take medicine very consistently. And so I was like, oh, so why do you think it didn't work? And she said, well, when I tried it, I coughed immediately. So it made me not want to continue to take, taking the medicine. And so it ended up kind of being this loop of like, well, this doesn't work. So, um, so I'm not going to try it. Uh, anymore even if in long term it ends up helping because immediately I coughed and um and so I kind of I kind of was doing like shadow work with her saying oh that's really interesting so or do you think you're kind of like weighing this definite cough against a future nebulous cough that might you know like that might not happen you know and she was you know sitting there with it and I was and she was like maybe and I said uh it'd be interesting if we could like track the cough somehow, you know, and, uh, and then just implement like a different, uh, 
medicinal thing or action every day and that kind of thing. And then she said, well, well, I don't want to just talk about it. I want it, don't want it to be just a constant thing in the room. And I was able to, to kind of string that together. And she kind of just kept on like avoiding uh, the prospect of tracking it. And I was like, it sounds like you're worried that if we start to track it, then we'll be talking about it constantly and you'll never be able to get away from it. And, uh, and she like sat there, you know, for a moment was like, yeah, I didn't realize that's what I was saying, but that's what I'm saying. And so all that to say is that like, now I like downloaded an app that already existed on her phone that cough, that tracks coughs and like even makes like a little chart for you to like show you like how things are going and everything's cause that's the already thing that existed that we never even thought to try. Um, and I don't know, it was just like a really cool moment of me getting to like show my mom and grandma and an, um, actually my brother was in the room as well. So that was pretty cool. Like everybody in the room, like my shadow work skills and my NVC stuff to like all string it together to like actually be able to like come up with a idea that like worked for everybody in the room. Um that kind of like cleared the air for about something that was very hard for us all to talk about. So I was just pretty happy about it. Thank you for listening. Go for it, Maria. All right. Just like one observation that I I've wanted to bring up and notice like this within my own family too, that it's like really interesting that we can all be like thinking about it and having intense emotions, but there's something about saying it, like saying the words, like talking about it, you know, like that to me, just like part of our human like behavior that we kind of do that. And I know it was like really prevalent within my own family too. Like we'd all be sitting at this table, like probably feeling fear and anxiety about this, but it's like, but we don't, we never like would speak it. So I love that you were like, and for those of you that don't know, uh, nonviolent communication is, is a book. It's actually a whole center, the whole center for nonviolent communication, but, um, a bunch of us have read it, um, it's by Marshall B. Rosenberg, PhD. And uh, Ezra has now more specialized training and, and gone deeper with it. And so, uh, which is amazing. And also because, yeah, it it's just awesome. Um, so it's just, I just kind of, that was like the observation, you know, like that, um, yeah, like the belief around what saying it out loud like will do or like that belief that the saying it out loud brings the attention to it but our attention's already on it you know it's just it just was like kind of an interesting thing yeah and i'm finding too that like because we never talked about it we never like officially put it in the parking lot like that's like kind of an nvc practice of like hey i have an issue that keeps coming up and i'm working on it but it's going to take a while for me to actually get through to through it and so if you kind of consciously put it in the parking lot and know that you'll eventually get back to it or that you, or that it's being worked on it kind of gives that thought the safety to not like constantly be tapping at your brain to try to solve it um and since we hadn't like approached it in that way, like that straightforwardly before, like there had been procedures and like, you know, various different things that she was trying. Um, but it was always like, it's didn't, they didn't work. So it was like, um, it was hard to talk about. Um, and so now that we actually, it feels like we cleared the air a little bit. Um, like, and I'm, I'm curious, like if, um, that alone will, will help a little bit like uh 
I had this image when we were talking about it of just like the cough TM, like as like its own entity, like in the room that only like gets stronger because we won't talk about it, <laughs> you know, like that kind of thing. And um, also like, you know, coughing as like an emotional release. Um, like there was somebody that I knew that like didn't, uh, that, that said that they didn't cry. But whenever they felt like they were be getting emotional, they would cough instead. Um, and so it's it feels like, you know, a there's something your body is like trying to get out, like literally. And, it, you know, it, there's. Um, and I and uh, I wanted to say, too, that I think Chantal, uh, yeah, said, uh, said something in there um, in the chat about. uh about also having a mom, a mom with chronic, with a uh, chronic COPD, COPD. And I'd find that the more I share about it, like growing up, it felt like this was only happening to our family. And so the more I share about it, the more like, I'm like, most people know somebody like who struggles to breathe for like, basically no reason other than, you know, the sh shitty air quality or, you know, um, uh, essentially toxic stress. I've been learning a lot about, you know, like um, toxic stress as, as the cause of many disorders and including asthma and stuff. And, um, and so it's just very interesting for me to like, you know, be able to talk about that and connect with other people who are having, you know, similar issues. And uh, yeah. I appreciate you guys listening to me and sharing and being receptive to, to hearing me out. Anyone else have stuff going on? And of course, we can change topics five times. We can do that. Oh, hi, Renee. Hello. Um, I had something I thought might be interesting for everybody, and I think it kind of ties into the journal prompt because... <clears throat> oh, sorry. Might take me a second to get there. Um, there was a brand new episode of Radio Lab, which is an NPR show and a podcast that I really like. Um, and it's about aphantasia. So that's when people cannot make the mental pictures and movies in their minds. And so, um, on the flip side of it is hyperphantasia, which is where you can have like every single detail crystal clear. So, um, the podcast started out with a woman who has like a lot of people, I think it's kind of a new thing to even know if you have aphantasia, <laughs> like it, it's just been like recent, it's kind of being talked about. So one of the women on the show, she has it. And as the show progressed, there was a producer on the show that has hyperphantasia. And then there was, um, like a neuroscientist who thinks he can give people with aphantasia the ability to slowly like build up mental pictures but when she heard the flip side of hyperphantasia the woman opted out of trying to the woman with aphantasia opted out of trying to be able to see the mental pictures and so the way I'm tying this into the the journal prompt and just something that's always kind of on my mind is just the double-edged sword. So if you have hyperphantasia, you've got this, you know, amazing escape hatch, you've got this amazing interior fantasy life, but you also can um, just picture everything. That's my puppy in the background playing, by the way, if you guys hear that. Um, like you like when you picture something bad happened to your loved ones like you can picture it in such detail 
that you know it's like watching a movie of it and it's really really terrible so um yeah it's just it's an interesting thing because it does seem like and it, for for every like gift there's there's kind of a dark side to it but for every dark side, there's kind of a gift to it too. At least that's been my personal experience. But I also just wanted to tell everybody, like, I mean, I listen to Radio Lab and This American Life all the time. But um, there's just some such good, good, good episodes on there. And this is really um, an episode worth listening to if you're at all curious about about that kind of thing. And that that's that's my that's my what's been on my my mind and my heart for the last few days so i'm gonna lower my or i'm gonna mute myself i always appreciate your shares renee i really appreciate all of your like special interests they all interest me too um because i i love understanding magic and the brain and uh dreams and stuff like that um I also really related to Ezra's share um I kind of grew up with my mom having that chronic cough and like my cough has gotten worse within the last like five years and it's my worst nightmare to sound like my mom like hacking all the time and like coughing uh so that was like <laughs> that was a really vivid nightmare come true um but I can also relate to that, that it really does tie in with the, the aphantasia thing. Cause also like, um, I, I have hyper aphantasia. I definitely have a very vast inner world, um, that I can very easily lose myself in. Um, but I've working on presence has really helped me to like, do so intentionally, like drop into the world, like intentionally and not just like, I don't have anxiety and then just walk out the door of my brain because it's too much. Um, but I also have something that ties into that called, um, I've heard it called mirror touch synesthesia, um, where I, this is the reason I can't watch horror movies too, is because when I'm watching all this like pain and torture and stuff, I can feel it. Like I, my nervous system is like, that's happening to me. And I will literally like grip my hand if I see somebody's hand, like them like cutting their hand to do like, I don't know. I watch a lot of Supernatural. So they cut their hand for a bunch of shit and I have to like look away um, and stuff like that. Um, and it's, it's, it does, it drops me into my own movie of that sort of thing that's happening. Um, so I'm, I'm very careful about the violence that I watch. Um, but I like I like horror movies that are like mysteries, like like I guess murder mysteries. I don't know. Like I like things that are like psychological th thrillers because those aren't as painful for me to watch. Um, sorry, I swear this all ties together. It's like this like generational anxiety. Um. Honestly, it stems from what I've been working on this weekend. So like I've been working on judgment um, this weekend and it's been a process of turning around um, when I really want to turn away. And it seems like when I turn away from it, that's when it gets louder and it feels like it's winning. And I feel like I'm losing, even though it's all me. Um, and that feels like that restricts my flow too, because I noticed that whenever my judgment says something, my oppositional defiance disorder is like, okay, I'm going to do the opposite of that because F you. And I just end up running in circles away from myself. Um, and it's really exhausting to feel like I can't give into the judgment or it like quote unquote wins. Um, and it feels the same way with breathing. It almost feels like when I'm uh, coughing and hacking, it's like, okay, I need to breathe less to make this go away. If I could just not breathe, then I wouldn't cough is like this weird, like 
loop that I go into underneath it. Um, or like, it's like this, like, you know, underlying, like, uh, I don't want to say motivation because that's not really a motivation, but it's like a, it's the stick, right? It's the thing I'm running away from, not the thing I'm running towards. Um, so <laughs> I kind of lost my train of thought. I was like, I swear this all connects, um, but I do have a lot of hands behind me. So um I think that's it. I think I'm going to go ahead and pass it off. Thank you for letting me rant. And uh, thank you for all of your shares. I really appreciate being in this space, especially today. Um, Bright and Dark feels a lot like my chosen family. So it's always nice to spend holidays with you guys. Go for it, Renee. Well, first off, I just want to say Ocean. You know, I, I love you so much, but um, I just had some uh, a little bit of maybe insight into um, the mirror synesthesia, because I think when we're kids, like whenever we watch movies, we all feel it, right? Like we all felt that. And then it kind of dulled for me personally, as I became an adult. Um, it's really funny, though. I I just everybody if you're ever watching a movie where people have to hold their breath underwater just pay attention if you're like sitting with someone else because I guarantee everyone in the room will be holding their breath like and they don't know it and then you'll hear someone go like and you know um <laughs> but one of the ways that I kind of um made that more livable is and this is kind of spoiling the magic, but I love to know how special effects work and like magic tricks work and all that kind of stuff. So um, like what used to scare me in movies, like now that I know how the special effects work, it doesn't like I spend, I kind of shift into this mode of like figuring out like, oh, that was like a blood packet and this was this and that was that. And like just figuring out how the special effects work kind of takes me out of the scary parts for a minute so I don't know if that's um like I said not everybody loves to spoil the magic and loves to know like all the little operational secrets but I I I do like that like I like and I love to watch like um, magic shows and illusion shows and I love to see if I can figure out how they did it now before I you know actually dig in and see if that's how it worked and the weirdest part about that is sometimes you can figure out a way that would work, which is not the way the magician made it work, which is also very satisfying. But anyway, I'm a little off track, but I just wanted to say um, that is a way I think you can kind of um, if if you're if anyone is at all interested in like dampening down a little bit of the the feeling sometimes that's that's worked for me. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Maria. Thank you. Um, this is what's kind of going through my brain. Um, the, so, and I, I tend to see, um, patterns and common threads. And so the common kind of thread that is just popping up for me is like beliefs, um, and kind of like belief work, um, even in like, are we basing our decision about what is like good, bad, or what we're percep perceiving like good, bad, or acceptable, not acceptable based on some sort of standard, whether that be like the medical community has like set a standard or what like the social norm is. And then is that, is that kind of what we're basing the belief on? Like just like going back to like, you know, Karen, just like using, you know, this as just a general example about like celebrating, you know, just the idea of like, we can't celebrate something until we felt like we like mastered it or conquered it or got over it. Um, or like talking about things, especially where like in the mind, 
like where we can collect data, but that data just comes from people like sharing their experiences and someone decided like what was normal and what was like acceptable. And then we kind of put beliefs or judgments on ourselves. And a lot of times they're not even our judgments or beliefs. They came from someone else telling us. And then we realized that we believe them and kind of accepted this, but you don't have to continue that way. Once you realize that you can choose to form like your own beliefs, um, you know, and, and, uh, um, ocean, like just one thing I wanted to share, if it res feels like resonating with you or not, but have you talked to the cough? Like, have you engaged with it? Like asked it, you know, what are we like, what are you doing here? <laughs> like how, what is your purpose? Um, and like feeling into that more. And then, but obviously there's like, there's resistance there and there's bringing up feelings of trauma and yeah, the cough, TM <laughs> trademark, um, totally. Um, it just like is, you know, when we're kind of talking about like the energetics of it, if we're, if we're like in resistance to it and certainly, you know, there's, all these sorts of nuggets, like someone said, um, you know, learning from the dark. Um, and is that, is that mean we're perceiving like dark as negative or, or dark as bad? Um, you know, like it is what it is, right? The cough is, um, and we're putting like a label on whether it's like good, good or bad, but it it is what it is for you. Right. So if it's like, if it's, if it's bothersome, if it's feeling like you want something to change. And of course, I'm not saying that it's, it's easy. I'm not saying that all of those things are like easy to do by any means. It just, what it's kind of bringing up it, and really the main point of it is just what it's bringing up for me is it's so like rooted and based on like what, what we believe and what we believe is not fixed. That's all. I'm going to pass it off to Jim Marie. Thank you. I'm going to try so hard to remember what I was going to do because it's so good. It is, I swear it's on topic. Okay. Can we go back to Renee talking about uh, their relationship with horror movies, right? How you have reached this point where you're able to uh, experience a, what you see on a horror film and understand kind of what's really going on you're not like caught up in uh the uh the show of it right right are you with me guys yes She's totally right about that being a very real thing that we are able to do and a very powerful perspective shift that we're able to to do when we realize I'm not in the horror film. I'm witnessing it, but I'm not like all caught up in it. You get to this like observer perspective about it. And it becomes this, you approach it with curiosity about, oh, how did they do this? How is this gonna unfold? Like, what are they, what's the underlying story here? And this is, in a lot of ways, what we are doing when we're starting to repair our relationship with that, um, that role is like the advocate for our bodies and the, that our lives are happening for us in some way is that you are doing the same thing that you're doing with these horror movies. You learn to do it with your own lived experience. So you're not all caught up in like what is happening you're able to actually process the experience in a way that is expansive and that you approach it with that curiosity, like inner workings of the universe, you know? So thank you for that opportunity to, to do that. That was really freaking cool. Um, okay. I'm going to jump off with my I don't see any hands after me and I'm on my phone. Does anyone have like a follow-up or a I do since like we've kind of gone deeper with it. Yeah. Go ahead, Ezra. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, so like, I often will like 
I'm like a very like an analytical movie watcher, like because I like that's you know I was a theater kid and I know Ocean was too and like um but like I also intellectualize things a lot and so I always am like why is this scary why did they think this would be scary like you know and that's why I don't love move like horror movies where like there's just a bunch of jump scares because I'm just like oh my gosh there's somebody that was I didn't expect someone to be there and they were there that's like you know like okay wow you you did it good job like like that kind of thing um and I also prefer like psychological or like, um, you know, metaphysical type of movies that, you know, make me wonder, like it make it explains to me, like, what is so scary about the unknown, um, you know, like and how like I'll watch a, a movie like about like ghosts or or something and I'm just like. You know, like I watched the tarot movie like re that Renee talked about. I kind of enjoyed it. It was like a romp. Like it wasn't trying to really be about tarot, but it also had some like cool monsters. It reminded me of Final Destination, which I really liked, which is just basically like death is out to get you in like uh, in like zany accidental ways. <laughs> but like, you know, and that's, you know, that can be like for me, that's like kind of fun. Um, but and they had some interesting like monster um art kind of thing which i appreciate like cool creepy art but um yeah like i do remember though the thing like what what ocean is saying about like dropping into the movie there are two specific movies usually when i'm watching a movie i'm fully aware the whole time that these are actors on a set like i very rarely actually get suspension of disbelief and even when i do a little bit it's like maybe like 50 percent i don't know i almost never forget that they're actors and so that's why when someone will say like that person was a really good actor i'm like i don't like most of the time i didn't really understand what they were talking about because it felt like most people could do that um like but then i there's like two different movies that i experienced one was about the acting which is lupita and Nyong, uh nyanga and she, like she was in us and there was a moment where I straight up felt like she was talking to me and I had to pause the movie and like walk away and basically like calm my nervous system um because I fully felt like that was happening to me um which is why like to this day I'm like wow she's an amazing actress because I actually forgot and there's very usually it'll happen like for a minute or two here and there and then I'll just be you know I'll just remember that that's an actor. Um, and then there was like hereditary, but it didn't really have as much to do with the acting as I think the music and the situation. Um, I mean, just dropping into a terrible situation, like a terrible situation. And I also had to pause the movie and walk away. Um, and so I remember, like I can vividly remember those things, but I just, it feel like it feels like it most of the time I'm just so aware that there's a director telling me a story right now. And I want to know like what the themes of the stories are of the story is. And like, if the scenes make sense together, given what I think the story is about and like all that stuff, like the structure of it is very important to me. Um, and it's less about um, dropping in there, like on a, on a sensory level. Um, but I think that's just, you know, it's just a different way to experience, you know, it's like the perspectives, you know, are you seeing this in like first person's perspective? Am I in the movie right now? Is this happening to me? Um, and another way that, cause, uh, Ocean mentioned before, so hopefully they're okay with me saying this, but like, uh, like you, I think you mentioned this a couple of SAS masses ago that you do like horror video games though, you can do something about it. Um, and so what that reminded me of is that like, whenever, like I always talk during movies, like I pause them and I talk about them and I'm like, I wouldn't have done that. Or it doesn't make sense that they did that. I don't really get that. Maybe they'll explain it later. And like, I always have deconstructed things with my family in the middle of it happening, you know, like, so that is my doing something about it is me imagining 
how I would react in that situation and like under those circumstances and in a lot of horror movies too like it simply would not be me <laughs> like I just like in the terror movie it would have never happened because I'll never break someone's door down to go and then go dig through all their stuff like that like that kind of stuff like I just it just wouldn't happen I wouldn't go into it down to a creepy room <laughs> um and and mess with some strangers shit <laughs> like I wouldn't um and so it's usually there is like a, a breach of contract that ends up happening in like those movies where like there's like repercussions for that breach of contract and that usually involves like this level of disrespect for the uh for the metaphysical world or uh the other side and um and to me that ends up showing me now I'm just getting into like deconstructing things so if someone wants to raise their hand I'll stop but like it shows me like how like there's so many like warnings especially to like uh people who don't believe in the other side like hey even if you don't believe it you're being really disrespectful in there you know like of um of you know actual energies that you have decided aren't real um and so some of them see definitely are like ooh the other side's all evil and like creepy and scary uh but i've been seeing less of those lately and usually now i've been seeing more like hey like if if you uh it's like if you fuck around you're going to find out <laughs> like that, that's it <laughs> that that usually that seems like the energy and a lot of good witches as well like i've seen a lot of like um which is in in movie culture becoming uh the saviors and if which, a witch is a bad guy there are other witches that are good guys you know and so they, they say like well some witches can be bad and others you know are, aren't and like uh so i've been noticing this cultural you know shift um around what constitutes uh like an evil uh witch and a ghost and a and how and honestly, most of the times they're like trying to tell you the needs of that particular creature. And it's not just the need of this creature is to like eat you and be scary. <laughs> and instead, it's like, hey, there's actually like it has a story and you are refusing to like have a conversation or listen to the story. Um, that's why I like the ring. The ring keeps on coming up for me, but I really like the ring. I rewatched it recently and it kind of holds up like still pretty you know like early 2000s but it's it's pretty good um and it very much has that like uh the ghost is trying to tell you something like listen to it like shut up and listen to it the ghost is trying to tell you something um and i really i like that so maria i think uh, you're the right i think you have one i hand up yeah okay the record yes, yes. was right over oh yeah sometimes that happens sometimes it like blends into depending on the background um one thing that like i noticed on like year three of like deep dive with shadow work and combination with scary movies because i was one that like stopped watching scary movies because it wasn't like representing what my experience it was and so, and then it was kind of like giving me this fear response, like, you know, it was activating my nervous system and I'm just like, I don't want to, I don't, I'm not watching these movies anymore. I don't want to do this. Um, but there was like some bit about fear for me, um, and in, in that, in like the shadow work piece of it. And, and like, so, and I say this with like, I'm not, I'm not saying that anything and that I'm experiencing is like funny. But when a sh when an onion sometimes gets peeled and another layer of shadow work, so a lot of times now my first response is just to laugh because I like, and and that's not like, it's not like that. It's not that I'm not maybe feeling mad, sad, angry, or traumatic. It's just like funny that oh okay there's light like this is a layer, um to it and like you know, everything everyone said too has, has been like very helpful about, you know, kind of how we're approaching, like how we approach or interact when, when that layer gets revealed. But, um, 
I, I'm having that, that interact. I'm having that shift with horror movies too, where at one time I used to feel like so afraid and now things are funny to me. Like now, like kind of like Renee, like you said, I can almost like see it more for what it is. And my like, and then I kind of seeing it and it helps that my partner kind of sees it that way too, of like a little bit more comical. And then yes, like movies like The Ring or, you know, there, there are some things that I watch, right. When you just want to like write Netflix and chill or like, you know, dissociate maybe. Um, but there are also some movies that it actually has given me a lot of great things to like think about and talk about. And I end up like doing a lot of processing during the movie, just about like a lot of the, you know, maybe a lot of shadow work or just my magical experience. So it, it all depends on like what it is, but it is, it's an interesting shift that I'm having where I've kind of went from just like banning it all. And now maybe, you know, watching little bits here and there, usually because someone else is watching it that I'm like, oh, you're kind of finding this like more funny. And that's just interesting, like something I'm noticing. Um, but then I just kind of connected it that I'm also kind of doing that with my shadow work. And again, I still feel like the full array of human emotions. Um, and sometimes, you know, my nervous system is so engaged that um, all like that I'm not really processing shadow work that I'm just like feeling my feelings um, that day. But but when the when the shadow work initially does get unveiled to me, I end up kind of laughing out loud. And then the perspective shift for me is like, oh, like here it is. So like we can like let's get to let's get to it. Like let's let's look at this and you know, let's let's engage with this um as kind of like, yeah, like here we are. So uh let's see. I don't know. Renee and Ocean, I think it was, I don't know. Renee, I think, had their hand up first. Sometimes it's hard to tell with the um, Renee. I just I just had a quick thing, and that is uh I I like Maria said, you know, you peel back a layer of shadow work and then you find like there's like some amusement in that because you know, like comedians say like things are only funny if there's like a grain of truth to them. And um that's how that feels to me and uh I I find just about everything like slightly amusing in life you know <laughs> um, I have a hard time being serious about things um which I'm sure is some sort of coping me mechanism I haven't dealt with yet but um but yeah it's really fascinating um the way that you put that Maria that like you know once you've peeled back this layer um like there there is always something kind of funny about it like because it rings true usually you know and uh that's all i had to say thanks renee ocean where are you they were <laughs> yeah um i'm not sure what you mean by that silver um they put in the chat could you let could you mention let the monster get you which is which is like a concept that we talk about here that like um when there's like a concept that you're struggling with it's um like turning around and letting the monster get you are you talking about the convergence last year um because I was really scared. Um, I woke up at like four o'clock in the morning on Friday on the convert at the convergence last year, and I wanted to commune with the Aries moon while it was still out. And well, it was technically Saturday, um, because it was Friday night, but um so the moon was still out, and we were supposed to have the ritual that night. So I wanted to commune commune with the moon first thing in the morning while it was still like a hundred percent. Um so I was sitting outside, I was alone in the dark and I was looking up and I was like in the forest and the moon was full and I was like, this is great, had a beautiful aura around it. And then it occurred to me that I was sitting alone in the dark in the forest <laughs> and I was like, oh, 
uh, this is kind of scary. And I was starting to kind of feel that anxiety creep up on me. Um, and I kind of just looked around me, which probably didn't help my paranoia to like, I, I don't know, like give into it. But um, I was looking around and I thought maybe there was like, I started to feel like there was like something watching me and like a wolf or like a wolf man cryptid like thing in the forest. I was all like picturing, you know, this big scary monster. And I sat at the table and I was like, I'm not going to let um, myself get up until I'm not afraid anymore, until I've like moved past it is what I was thinking. I was like, I'm going to be a badass witch about it, um, thinking I'm going to like push through, right? <laughs> it's hard to tell sometimes when it's like a danger rush and when you're like uh, forcing your system, when you're like bulldozing your system. And so I was sitting there and I was like thinking that was a good idea. And but then, you know, I worked my way into convincing myself that I was fine, which is like what a lot of us do when we're stressed out. And then so I got I gathered up my stuff and I went to the door and I put my hand on the door and I felt my heart jump like I was so scared and ready to go inside. And I just stopped with my hand on the door handle and I just let myself feel it for a second. And I was like picturing this like thing like jumping over the fe the the like uh railing of the like patio deck thing that we were on or that I was on and uh like getting me before I could even get in the door which I already had my hand on the handle of um and so I just let it in my mind I just let the monster get me and then I walked inside and I went back to bed for a couple hours I didn't really think much of it until later when I was uh in the ritual um Because I didn't die, Taryn. She said, why would I let the monster get me? Because I survived. Because the monster wasn't a physical monster. And it's because of that, it's not embodied. Because I am embodied, I I don't have to fear that particular monster, if that makes sense. Um, and I, I also wanted to touch on the, the horror thing again, too, with the, the, so, so I love what Renee said about deconstructing, like, why, um, or, um, I'm sorry, I can't repeat your words, but I can respond to them. So, um, I, I, um, uh, learning to not be so afraid by, understanding the special effects that go into it actually was one of my first hobbies like one of my first special interests like um uh as like a teenager I learned to do special effects makeup because I wanted so badly all my friends like horror and stuff and I was like oh I want to be you know into that stuff but I don't really like it so I'm just gonna go like be a techie about it and do the stuff in the background and understand how to create horror but it didn't really help me be able to watch movies like much better. Um, I do get better about them. I, I have a friend who um, in California who um, would sit and watch movies with me and like make fun of them. And that, that actually does help. Um, so um, please include me in the movie night. I saw that in the comments. Um, but I wanted to talk about the special effects, especially because uh when when i learned how to embody the monster that's where the magic started happening for me um because learning to do that makeup on myself and kind of learning to bring out the monster within myself and be able to interact with that in a in a way that physically represents it that's a spellcraft like that's magic um so there's like a hundred different ways to do magic and any way that you do is totally valid and I feel like that's important to stay um I really like the thought train that you're on Taryn you ask really awesome questions 
She said, so everyone is just talking movies and it's not a metaphor for life. <clears throat> I love that so much because I've been, I have been hyper-focusing on this concept called symbolic interactionism and I've been applying it to everything and I just get so excited when I get to bring it up um, because that's the whole point is like you get to create the metaphors for yourself based on your own perspective. The reason it's so cool to talk about all these movies with like a whole bunch of people is because you get to see what symbols they ascribe what meanings to or like what you know like does that make sense like what um meanings they ascribe to different symbols um and then you get to know how to interact better with people by sharing your metaphors and what they mean to you okay thank you for letting me go off <laughs> go ahead maria hi i thought i would just share what i think of when like let the monster get you and so like obviously there are times where you might be in danger and your adrenaline like acts appropriately and you need to run away and that's not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about let the monster get me um because there are times where there might be danger and you do need to respond and so um if that's happening in your reality right so most times my monster um, is the, so in Bright and Dark, sometimes we talk about the real, R-E-A-L, which is the here and now, which is um, the space that I try to be in or at least bring myself back to because of my flavor of the way that my brain works, I go into the R-E-E-L-S, for me, that means the movie reels that I play in my mind. Either I'm thinking about the past and playing over all those scenarios, or I'm looking to the future. And a lot of times, mostly it's in the future in the re and the movie reels playing out. Well, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if that happens? So the monster is like, for me, is like the what if, the what if this happens, um, and again, I'm, I'm not present at this time. I'm not in the, in the here I'm, I'm in the movie reels in my mind. And so let the monster get you would be okay. So what if that happened and a mat and, and a play it out and then what happens? And a lot of times like, so doing that, and this isn't, this maybe not for everyone or how everybody does this or thinks about it. But letting the monster get me, I'm I'm already in the movie reels, right? My brain is already doing that. And so I I just let it, I let it happen. Um, yeah. So that that happened. And then I can process the feeling. I can then be present with like the fear or sadness or what a lot of times when I'm in the reels, it's those more types of emotions, like the fear, anger you know, sadness. Um, and so I'm letting my body kind of process that and feel the feelings. And then sometimes a lot of times, and then at that point, I'm able to then bring myself back to the here and now and be present. And so um, that to me is like what that means by like letting, letting the monster get you. Um, and in actuality, like, like ocean kind of said, like, I'm actually fine. I'm actually okay. Um, I am, you know? And so, uh, yeah, I mean, and other people may have other kind of experiences or ways that they kind of engage with that, let the monster get you. Um, and what it does for me, um, I'm not the most patient witch that existed. Um, and so <laughs> uh, when I feel, it also allows me to like, work through sometimes large amounts of shadow work like kind of uncovering that but I have to have my system needs to be supported I have to feel I have to be rested 
Um, I want, I need to want to do that. I have to be in a space to do that. I don't have to do it. Nobody's forcing me. I'm not putting judgment on myself about how that interaction happens. So those are just like things to keep in mind. Cause, um, there's no comparison. There's no, like, you know, there, you don't get a, unfortunately there's no gold stars. Like <laughs> we should start giving them out though, because we all love gold stars, but you know, like, it's, it's just, it's really about your experience. So it's, it's all about, um, it's all about the experience. It's not, for me, it's not about like getting, it's no longer about accomplishment, which man, if you really knew me, you would know that that took a lot for me to just say, because <laughs> I am the oldest daughter, niece, uh, cousin, uh, overachiever, uh, type A, these are like past versions of myself that I, that I engaged with. Um, and accomplishing was everything to me because that meant I was valid. Uh, it meant I was accepted. Um, and that's what I wanted. Right. Um, and it was a trauma response. It was a way that I also kind of, yeah, felt safe. Um, because I wasn't getting that with my immediate family at home. So I, I sought it outside of within peers, within extended family and other communities, right? Friends. Um, so sorry, like this kind of went, this is just where it's going. So thank you for coming on the journey with me. I was like, um, but um, yeah, so, so for me, like getting the monster, letting the monster get me when I'm in the movie reels in my mind is a way to like process shadow work. Um, and, you know, and sometimes, and, and, and some times it, um, it does kind of allow me to feel neutral. So my, the way that I kind of know I'm like moving through shadow work, my own personal benchmark is not when I feel like I'm over something because I'm I'm a human, I'm a magical being having this human experience, right? So I came here for the human experience. I still have a fuck ton of questions about shit in this earth. But one thing that I do know is I'm here for like experience, this human experience in, in, in particular. And so the way that I kind of know I'm like moving through shadow work is for me is actually a feeling of neutrality. Um, like I can almost like look from like the observer perspective in a way and, and kind of feel more neutral about it. It doesn't mean that the universe won't like be like, okay, so um, I believe that like it's giving me bits and pieces for me to experience that because if, if like I got the whole entire bucket of shadow work at once, it would probably be completely overwhelming for me. So it's giving me like these pieces. So when we talk about like peeling the layers, it's like, that's kind of, that's why I believe there are layers. So we can interact with it and then get to the next layer, but are we really over it? Like I don't believe in that concept anymore that you get like over something. It's just like, this is how I'm engaging with this thing at this time. And the only person that can judge how I'm doing is me. And that also took like a lot of shadow work to, to kind of get to that point. And it doesn't mean that I don't, don't want other people that I trust to weigh in because I, that's the only way that I can see other perspectives. So it's not to say that, um, but the people that I now look for, for other perspectives, like has shifted based on my alignment. So I don't know. I felt the need to say all that. Thank you for listening to me, Renee. <laughs> well, I loved it. Um, I just real quick wanted to just touch on the monstrous feminine. And I mean, I can't even like put it in a nutshell. I can put it in like maybe the quarter of half of a nutshell. Um, so I myself I've been like a monster girl as long as I can remember like I love monsters and um my mom actually wrote this poem about me a couple of years ago called my daughter and the two-headed calf about how I would bring it home and love it <laughs> you know um but so one thing I just wanted to mention about like letting the monsters get you and stuff is it seems like and maybe this comes with age you start sympathizing or empathizing with the monster right so like I know Medusa is having like this huge moment because everybody is like she got a raw deal and it's like and she's just trying to hang out in her cave and people are trying to kill her but 
it's kind of that point where you get to where you like you're on the monster side right so um it is just interesting to uh i guess and that kind of like feeds into uh, maybe the journal prompt you know but just like there's two sides to everything you know and I think you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't look at the other side, even if you don't agree with it. But um, the monstrous feminine, I'm sure we could do like, I mean, there's like just so many books written about it. I'm sure we could do like a whole day about it without getting into it. But it is like a really interesting, satisfying kind of little dip to take if you if you are a monster lover at all. Um and let's see who I thought I thought somebody had their hand up, but if nobody has their hand up, I had one other little thing I was going to mention, which is totally off topic. But I was just thinking about like kind of ambassadorship and what like I'm just going to tell my story of like the first time I met real witches. So my sister and I, I think I'd mentioned, we kind of were dabbling with things here and there. And um, like a witch shop opened up in our town of Fairbanks, Alaska, and it was called the Mystic She, and it was spelled, you know, S-I-D-H-E. It was spelled like the Celtic way. And um, my sister and I <laughs> would go, it was in a strip mall and it was like downstairs in a strip mall. And we would go in there and the two women that were always in there, um, they would offer us tea and so we'd always have a cup of tea and we would stand around in there and we would and my sister and I and we're both like big mouths you know but we wouldn't say a word like we would just stand there and drink our tea and kind of walk around and look at things but it was like we were too like scared to talk to anybody um and that was my personal experience and I mean these women were so welcoming so nice like right there to answer any questions but we just were like like we wanted to be there but we also felt out of our element so we didn't really know what to to do and, or how to you know I don't know it was anyway it's interesting so I'm just thinking a lot about just you know there's a lot of resources for people now but the kind of in-person thing I think is really important but also just being like a good ambassador, like giving someone a really good first experience, um, meeting people, uh, I think is really important um, instead of kind of being heavy handed and like, um, like a cliche almost, you know. Um, anyway, that's kind of on my mind. And um, I, I guess also, I just really, I like I love the virtual space and being able to be with people from all over the world but um I'm just wondering what people think about that like for younger witches like just to be able to have almost like like a clubhouse you know like a place where you can physically go um and then I just lost my whatever I was trying to say so I'm gonna pop off Hi. So a place like, I think that is a wonderful thing, a place, you know, for physical space for people to go and gather where I think it is, it sometimes can be problematic, um, is if it's like, you know, for if it's a power over kind of a dynamic rather than it's it, it really depends on like where you're coming from, right? So I can only speak to my perspectives because like there's lots of there's peop there's people, there's covens and there's religions within the witchcraft community, and they're teaching a specific tradition or religion. Um I suppose what I what I want for myself and for other witches is to have a space where, which is what we're doing here, 
<laughs> just coincidentally, um, you know, but I, I, in the virtual space, I, so I understand what you're, Renee, you're seeing first physical space, space is, um, for, for people to discover who they are. And, and so if the, if that space fosters that discovery process, then I think it's amazing. I think that's where I'm at with it. Uh, Jemery. not alone so there's distracting okay so i have a lot to say about this actually um and i think it's kind of it amuses me uh, number one is we're we're working on it actually <laughs> like we like i think there's an agreement that a physical sink like physical sanctuary locations are something that's kind of on a lot of our radars uh I am hearing it more and more and more and more. And so when that kind of stuff starts happening, the support team starts like pivoting to kind of meet those needs. And so, and then what's really funny is that we are literally serving a huge community of super psychic fucking witches. And so what generally happens is we, we we're working on something and then we start hearing it at like SAS you know, it would be cool, you know, it would be great. Like, what, what do you, what is everyone's thoughts on this? And it's like stuff that we're working on, which is so great. Thank you for the validation and the like, uh, calibration check to make sure that like, we're, we're heading in that direction. Two is, uh, not even five minutes ago, I was just talking to, um, Akasha and Wit and anyone that's actually been to my home it is set up like an adult like clubhouse right Be and you are my neighbor like literally <laughs> so, like you could I mean you, you you could come over to my house can yeah. can I um can I bring you some rose syrup later I'm gonna make wild rose syrup today um yeah okay i'll uh i'll send maria all my contact info through the um email and maybe we can relay that but yeah that's that's my plan for today and i heard that you already have a costume for the summer solstice party in my house next week oh yes oh yes i right. have a one it's got like the built-in fan to keep it puffy i will bring that yeah no, no, no. Um, they all you too bring you too bring yourself too with it how are you with the badminton racket <laughs> i i i grew up with a badminton racket in my hand no i'm just kidding but yeah i'm i'm i uh i'll chat with you but i'm kind of full-time um taking care of my phineas right now yeah I get but it. um but yes i definitely um i will try to catch up with you later today if that's cool no, absolutely. That's so funny. We are we are making all of this happen, guys. Look at this. Oh, oh my God. I love you guys. You're amazing. I'm gonna stop now. But I don't know how to lower my hair. I'm I'm gonna jump on and just say I'm so spoiled in every way because I'm like spoiled with having the best online community, and I feel like I'm spoiled with having the best local community. And part of the reason I love my local community, and I just want other people to experience this, is it's very similar to our community where it's very eclectic and like like kind of anything goes and and no one's a, really like the leader, you know, um, everybody is doing their own thing. And um, that's what's funny whenever somebody kind of comes into that space just like we were talking about someone coming into our virt virtual space that kind of is like I know the best way to do things and I'm going to take over and um you know there's just there's a bunch of strong like independent minds that are like no that's not why we're here we're not here for that you know um and that happens in my local community as well and I guess you know like I said I feel spoiled and lucky and I just want other people to have that experience as well and just um be able to go into a place where people are super knowledgeable but super not judgmental and just um whatever you're doing it's cool we're learning from you and whatever you know 
sorry i'm just i'm I, i'm feeling warm and fuzzy so otherwise i'll start waxing on so i'm gonna hop off now too yeah and i know stephanie has their hand up i just wanted to follow quickly something that i respond responded to renee um and that was exactly kind of there there's also like no judgment here um because i uh, um like i feel like i you know often talk about you know that we're not practicing a religion here um or any sort of tradition but like people may go on from here and choose to initiate into that because that's where they feel their path is and so there's also like nothing wrong and i love when people from a tradition come in and share because i like learning about those things i don't necessarily want to participate but the the main idea being that your path is your own and you get to choose that um, without feeling shame or guilt. And that's, yeah, that's it. We're Stephanie, your turn. Hello. So I was not planning on having much to say today because I'm only here for a bit because I forgot that today was Father's Day <sighs> because my mother-in-law is in hospice and I was down there all week and the mundane is just kicking my butt and I'm having a dark night of the ego today and was just in a whole place but then as y'all were talking about spaces I was synchronistically changing my profile pic because I did not want my like professional headshot to be on there and so that is a picture of where I live like I live in that valley and I so desperately want to have like a tiny house there on the farm where people can come and like stay and like barter you know, like help me build a rock wall and you can stay there for a week and, you know, move a couple of rocks and have your own little vacation and help me build a altar to embark and, you know, whatever, come and go and leave and stay and community and people. And so I was just going to chime in that, yes, I too very much want community and space and in real life stuff and little waypoints on the underground railroad of witchery that we all can like bounce across i mean this out of real life weird dreamscape thing that we all connect on is beautiful but there is also something about smelling each other's pheromones that you know there's a whole other level too that I don't know in real life does have its own magic to it the end thank you did you say the end yes <laughs> so I just wanted to reply to that and that the times where people have maybe set up spaces and maybe it didn't work for whatever reason. I generally like mentioned this a couple of times. Um, that's like 99% of why we actually do shadow work here and like why we focus on the shadow work <clears throat> so that when we come together in a physical space, we do the thing. Um, and we have like tools to, communicate, to express our feelings, um, to hold space for each other without getting burnt out. Um, all of like those types of things of why maybe in other community spaces where we have that data of like what didn't work. Um, and even within bright and dark in the, in the three years, like we've gone through different things that we have like data on that didn't work. Um, even within the virtual space. And so, the shot, just the shadow work piece of it tied in with how we communicate with each other and is, is how we make that work in the like really long, long term. Um, thanks. Mira.
Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, here am I doing the brave thing and coming on the screen and talking to all of you. Yay, I'm so excited. Um, not really, I'm terrified. <laughs> Um, I mean, I have all sorts of things to say about uh, everything that everybody has said, and I've been writing furiously because my ADHD brain uh, doesn't allow me to remember anything when I'm in the middle of talking. Um, uh, also, the tism, that doesn't help either. Um, but what I really want to do is touch on um, what Karen said all the way at the beginning about um, her mindset shift. And um, how I'm currently going through that whole thing as well. In fact, like just in the last couple of weeks, um, I haven't I haven't engaged with any of the workbooks yet, except for the April one. Um, and I actually just reread it the other day, and it made me start to cry. And uh, I will start to cry right now. I've actually been bawling this whole time. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, the mindset shift. And uh, right now I'm in the middle of um, peeling back that layer of onion um, and having that other side of it come back up in the... My friend just moved into my house. I live in an apartment, um, which is really great. She's a wonderful, wonderful person. Um, she has a cat and I love this cat. The cat is not supposed to be here in the building. Um, so we kind of just snuck her in um, and she's, she's relatively quiet, but I didn't realize how stressed I actually was about getting kicked out. Um, I've lived here for, it's coming up on nine years now. Um, and so I've just been sitting with this, this stress. I uh, didn't sleep very well last night and I'm like, oh my God, like every little noise the, the neighbors are going to hear. Um, so for nothing, everything seems to be okay, but I can't, I can't shake that feeling. And I'm really trying very hard to, now I'm like, oh, okay, well, let the monster get me. Like what, what would be the biggest deal? I would get kicked out. That's okay. We're planning on leaving anyway. We're just needing to find a different place. Um, so there's that bit. And then I've got my mom trauma also that keeps coming back up. Um, big, 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 big wound there. Um, and every time I call her, I have to pretend that nothing's wrong because I'm not ready, not ready to say, um, I don't know if she's actually a narcissist, but she has narcissistic tendencies and tends to make things all about her. Um, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure of the best way to actually, uh, engage in the conversation with her. Um, I live in British Columbia and she lives in Alberta. Uh, I'm not the best on the phone. What I really want to do is write a letter and send it to her, but I also don't want to be a jerk about it. Um, and I have a tendency to, well, seem jerk-like, I guess, um, because I tend to state things clearly um, and I'm not necessarily gentle about it. Um, and then all of that, uh, I'm actually uh, talking with her cousin that lives in Israel, and I. Uh, it was just a sort of a random thing that happened. Um, but I've I've come more into my abilities uh, since this mindset shift of. Uh, I, I'm I'm going to say psychic abilities. Um, that's that's exactly what they are. Uh, Claire sentience uh, and clear audience um and I can't even I can't even talk to my mom about it I'm afraid of her judgment I'm afraid of what she's gonna say and so I've started to communicate with her cousin who lives all the way across the world because I can't talk to my mom um so yeah uh and then that piece of like the terrified of the unknown um Maria I'm right there with you with the what ifs and so I'm sitting here doing that uh and uh, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot there. I feel like I'm just spiraling a little bit. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm not really sure what to say now. So I'm going to drop that mic. Um, and thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Mira. I just wanted to tell you that um, 
Well, first, I wanted to thank you for sharing and for being vulnerable and for showing up. And that um, you're allowed to just share here without any feedback or if, but if you're looking for feedback, we do want your consent because consent is like very important okay, to us. Okay, yeah. So, All the feedback, like, please. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Petra. <laughs> Hello all. Sorry. I'm like still in the process of setting up my office. So space in my kitchen. Um I just put some things in the chat there for you. Um a book that is for adult children of emotionally immature parents and it does a really good job of like <clears throat> kind of going through the different types of emotional immaturity and the different dynamics and also um, speaks to like how to have conversations with them and like kind of what to expect um, I feel like it's really hard it's also a piece where like everyone kind of um sorry there we go everyone says like I don't know if they're narcissistic or what whatnot but the the truth of the matter is that narcissism and emotional immaturity like present very similarly and it's often like developmentally what happens for our parents is that they don't progress past a certain emotional like level of maturity and that's why they present narcissistically because children are narcissistic at a certain point they have to kind of be like I'm the center of the universe and then they have to be taught that like you have to consider other people and then this is how compassion works and this is how empathy works and <clears throat> many of our parents um never learned those skills um or ne were never taught them or like in some cases refused to learn them like you know it's complex <laughs> so um and I just wanted to like validate that like very often our parents are the least safe people for us and so it makes total sense to me that you're reaching out to other family members to feel seen and heard and validated and I think that that is completely fine I think also it would make sense to me if there was like some shame and guilt and things that come up in in that need because I'm um very certain <laughs> that um from the sounds of it that a lot of your needs weren't met as a kid and so um, just know, like, it, uh, your body won't know this, but at least intellectually, uh, I just encourage you to, to kind of understand that, like, the shame and the guilt and that stuff that actually belongs to the adult parent, right? That's something that we take on as children and we carry for our parents because our parents refuse to carry it and because we need the bond with them to not die <laughs> as children, we hold it for them. And so there's a lot of, that's uh, a really difficult thing because it impedes us in our adult lives from actually getting our needs met because we feel like they're too much or, or like it's overwhelming. And it's like, really, no, our parents were never enough. That's, that's the crux of the thing. And, um, and something that I personally have learned is that like for the right people, you will never be too much. <laughs> um, and this community has really taught me that there, there have been times when I have come to this space incredibly dysregulated and needed a lot of support and felt like I'm asking so much and everyone's just like, I'm so like, will be like, I'm so validated by your sacred rage, Petra. And I'm like, what the fuck is happening right now? I'm so deeply confused. But it's such a, it's these disconfirming experiences, like with your cousin and with like this community and with whomever you you learn to be like I think I can maybe trust this person with this piece let's try let's do a little test like those things are so impactful for our nervous systems and for our bodies and stuff like that so I just want to validate like how you're how you're feeling and um and know that like um that like very often you will never say something the right way for someone who has no interest in hearing what you have to say. And so I feel like, sorry, that, that was a little, like, that feels a little spicy. That feels a little, like, there's a little bit of a ping on this one. I'm like, this is, 
I don't know if it's a guide. I don't know if it's a whatever. I don't know what's happening, but that feels like really important to say is that like <clears throat> sometimes we have to just say the truth no matter how it lands. And, um, and often, especially parents, they carry a lot of their own shame with things and they don't want to face it. Right. And having us be like, Hey, here are the ways that you hurt me. They can't engage with that whatsoever. They don't know how to sit with their shame. They don't know how to like hold space for themselves, let alone us, let alone anyone else. Right. And those are all skills and deficits that they have. That's not about um, us. It's a reflection of their capacity and not our, our needs. And I just, um, as you're kind of going through this process of kind of reflecting on what you want to say, I think it just feels important to say like, you know, do the, like read the book, do the learning, figure out whatever, but also know that there might be a, a, a possibility where like, you just have to say whatever the fuck is in your heart and your mom will probably not be okay with it. And that's like that repair might never be possible. And that, that place is really hard because I think that it's like you, it means that we have to get to a place where we're ready to like release the thing entirely, which is not a small thing. And so I'm not being like, let's rush into this. I'm just like, FYI, my autistic brain is like, here are all the permutations of the thing. So I just wanted to validate those things and also just be like, this is hard shit. It's important shit, but it's very hard shit. And um, I've been estranged from my mom for almost a decade and my dad for about three years. And so, um, you know, and, and with my father, that is a relationship where I am, I've gotten to a place where I'm regulated enough to be able to tell the truth soon here and see what happens. Cause I think that he's teachable, but with my mother, that is something that I've had to accept that she will just never she just like cannot see me, cannot hear me, can is like emotionally probably a toddler and and that that is not possible. So whatever it looks like for you, you know, like your heart, your guides, your your path is your own. And I have all kinds of confidence that you will figure it out and find and we'll be here for you while you do that. So I just wanted to say that. Stephanie. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So I'm not sure if this will be applicable or not to your situation, but I was just going to chime in on something that I went through with my parents. So mine, of course, are, you know, their own messed up versions. And I was going through my own shadow work and progressing through the layers. And I got to this big, like one of my core central, you know, things. And I've been carrying this thing for years and years, like 20 years of this issue with my father and this issue with my mother. And like, I hadn't told my dad that I loved him in 20 years and like this huge weight. And, you know, I got to this point where like, I'm going to freaking address it. Like, I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to address it. And I was so nervous and so terrified. And oh my God, like I'm going to confront them. I'm going to tell them all the stuff. I'm going to apologize. I'm going to lay it out all on the table. And so I'm like terrified, but I'm going to do it. And so I just did it. And I say all the stuff and I say, you know, this is what I think happened in my adolescence. And this is this, and this is this. And I give this little spiel and they both look at me and just kind of stare at me like deer in headlights. And they act as though I spoke in French and they say like the most bizarre not applicable like like they literally said well you throw your problems up in the air and then you see what you catch and you want to catch your own like something not not appropriate at all to the conversation and then change the subject and talk, start talking about the weather like that was the huge climactic thing and I was like what <laughs> wait a second what I've been putting this off for 20 years and that that's that's the thing and I just realized like they can't they can't they couldn't they couldn't hear it they couldn't deal with it they may not have even been seeing it this whole time 
you know, like I have been seeing it. Like I am so beyond their level of growth and maturity. And like, I mean, no offense to them, but you know, like she was saying, like they're four and I'm 40 and bless their hearts. But like, yeah, it just, ugh, I was speaking French. And so it did ease my burden and I could drop that ball and stop carrying it. And I spoke my truth and I said, I was sorry. And I gave them an opportunity and I threw the ball to them and they let it fall on the floor. And now it is over and there's peace in my heart and it is over and done with. So I'm just saying like, in my mind, I had made up the story that it was going to be this huge, complicated, like dynamic of us back and forth and da, 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 da. And it was just like, meh. So I don't know. I guess the moral of my story is your brain may or may not be right on all of the made up stories of how it's going to end up and good luck, whatever path you choose. And there could be 3000 different end points on how it will actually go if you decide to pursue it. Thank you, Stephanie. I too want to acknowledge that we're very close to the end of our time in respect to the mods. We like to keep it try as close to ending time as possible. So just wanted to throw that out there. Um, just uh, my kind of process with that um, really quickly kind of started with, uh, I have like kind of not talking to my mother and really just kind of engaging with my emotions on it. And also knowing that I could talk to her about all these things and I could never talk to her about all those things. And I'm still going to do me like I'm still going to, you know, whether I choose to or not. Um, and that's like a choice. And someone says something once like uh, that, you know, like I'm I'm like an 100 gallon person and my mother was like a 10 gallon. And so she may have been at her capacity, but my it wasn't what my capacity was. Um, and the, the whole, for me, it was almost like looking at relationships and, you know, first the recognizing and the grieving that I didn't have the mother daughter relationship that society told me was the norm or what I was supposed to have. And I found myself being jealous of other like mother daughter relationships and like, and then seeking support like elsewhere because it didn't feel like I was getting that. Um, and just a, just kind of however you want to engage with it, just my process was there was a lot that I did with my inner work that I never, I never talked, it, she, I never physically engaged her with. And that like, that was helpful to me also. And then later I, at different times, there was a bit of engagement, but I never had like that really deep conversation that I maybe thought I would but I no longer feel like necessarily need to and then I just kind of meet the relationship of like where she's at and so like although I do have the relationship with her it's not any sort of uh what society would deem as like maybe a traditional you know mother-daughter relationship and that is now okay with me there's still trauma there like there's still hurt and there's still there's still a lot of feelings there um, so just, just so you know, like there's, there's, uh, kind of finding that way that you feel in your bones and your soul is like the right way for you to proceed and that it will be like a process. And yes, we're here, like as much as you want to share about it. Awesome. Thank you very much, Maria. Thanks everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ocean, I know there was one more way in, um, but I, I know we're at the end of time. So I didn't know if we should wrap it up or if we should take one more way in. Let me. It, it was me and it was very short. I just wanted to make sure that Mary knew that she was supported and that we're all here for it. And we have had a lot of similar situations and we can help. That was it. Thank you, everyone. What a great sass. A lot to think about. Have a good day. We'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.